reopening of the Maleficati Asante Institute at 5535 Germantown Avenue. We're really delighted uh, to see all of you coming to this uh, lecture and we know that there are some of you who are already on uh, YouTube and we're very happy for our YouTube audience. We've made a, a, a big change uh, trying to develop and work to create uh, a larger audience uh, through YouTube. So uh, I hope that the quality of our programming uh, is uh, not just equal to what we've had in the past, but even greater. Uh, we used to have, uh, as we will soon have here, I am sure, full houses, both in terms of physical uh, space in the auditorium, as well as large crowds uh, listening to us on YouTube. I want to thank the board of the Malefic Kete Asante Institute, uh, certainly starting with uh, Ana Yaninka, and then, of course, with the various uh, people like uh, uh, Carlton, Sudan, Stan Strata, Kareem Boyd, uh, also Valerie Harrison, and also Jabali Ade, uh, and Nada, the people who have helped to ensure that uh, we continue to run even during COVID. This is the year of recovery, but it's also a very strong year 
uh, for this uh, institute that has been uh, in operation since uh, 2011. So we're just really, really proud of the people who have come today from Philadelphia uh, to be in our audience. Uh, I'm going to also uh, remind you that we have a whole series of lectures. Uh, the next uh, lecture, uh, which you can get on by going to YouTube and searching for Molefe Kete Asante Lectures. And if you do that, it will pop up uh, live at 4 o'clock, normally on the date that we will be having lectures. The next one will be July 3rd. And we will have uh, Professor Nubintud Khalil. Professor Khalil is an expert in the Nubian language. Uh, we know a lot about the ancient Egyptian language, but Professor Khalil will talk to us on July 3rd about an introduction to the Nubian language. And this language goes back even further and longer. Uh, than uh, what we call Meru Nature of Chikam. So we're going to have a conversation with you and conversation with other people regarding that particular language. It's an African language, one of the classical languages of Africa, uh, because uh, we always say that the uh, that African culture has to be related uh, to uh, all uh, Nile Valley civilizations, including uh, Nubia, uh, Kemet, uh, Aksum, uh, and, and others uh, that sometimes we don't even talk about, uh, like Wawa. Yeah. So we're just really, really delighted uh, for uh, this opportunity to educate our community. And after that, we'll be listening to, uh, on July 26, uh, lessons from Ancient Egypt, Classical African Perspective by Dr. Kimani Nehusi. So we're just really, really happy and pleased uh, that we will be uh, uh, seeing all of you. But today we want to bring you just, uh, uh, we, we, we're actually trying out uh, our channel today. So we want to bring you uh, some taste of some of the comments that we have uh, by some of the great scholars that we have in the Philadelphia area. We also have visiting with us today, uh, but who will be speaking later on in the year, Dr. Rinaldo Anderson, who is an expert on Afrofuturism. He's one of the leaders in the Afrofuturist movement. So we are really delighted that he's here with us as well. So at this time, um, we give thanks also uh, to all the ancestors, to the great deities and the, and, the, and the great, great cosmic force. I always say that one of the things that we know about the great cosmic force is that you can't build a synagogue or a temple or a shrine or a church building for the great cosmic force because the great cosmic force is over all things in the universe. All nature is great cosmic force. The great cosmic force therefore is not just the mere deity. The great cosmic force, you can build a building for a deity, but you can't build a, 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 church, a building for the great cosmic force. And this is what our people discovered after many thousands of years in the Nile Valley, building the greatest buildings for, uh, uh, for uh, deities that they could think of. I mean, when you go to Karnak Temple, and we'll be taking a group to Karnak Temple next year, uh, 2023, uh, we will have a, uh, a tour of ancient Kemet. And uh, we'll be taking a group there. When you see Karnak, you see a building that was built actually for the gods. That's the way it was built. But even that building, at some point, uh, Africans had to abandon the idea of building a house big enough to contain the cosmic force. And that's why throughout the African continent, sometimes you don't see huge houses and uh, buildings built uh, for uh, uh, deities because people re recognize that you can't build it big enough. And so let's just have a little shrine here and there. 
And that is what has happened throughout the African world. So it's wonderful to see y'all. And I'm going to have, we're going to all speak about uh, 20 minutes. And if there are questions, I am sure that uh, uh, our uh, expert, Toyosi, will help us with those uh, questions from the audience after we all speak. The three of us speaking about 20 minutes. And I'm the, the, the first one would be Dr. Jabale Ade. He's a local favorite, popular rapping uh, uh, professor uh, who is well known in Philadelphia because of his own work, and his own uh, work as a corporate uh, uh, a person working with, with many groups uh, in the corporate world as well as in the education field. Uh, he's a scholar who's, who's writing articles and books and we're just delighted that he's here. He always brings the energy to us. So we're going to have him to speak. And after that, we're introducing uh, our wonderful Dr. Mount Dove, who is one of the leading scholars on African womanism, but she is also an expert on shake out the joke. You heard of Joe. He's a Senegalese scholar, a philosopher that we all know about, uh, considered by some people to be the greatest African intellectual of the 20th century. In fact, in 1961, when a group of African and African American and African Caribbean writers met in Dhaka, Senegal, they declared that the two most outstanding African intellectuals of the 20th century uh, were uh, Sheikh Anta Jope and W.B. Du Bois. And uh, the difference between Jope and Du Bois is that what Jope did was basically to turn all of world history on its head so that you saw that the African origin of civilization and the fact that black people were the originators of civilization was at the very core of what we do. Uh, du Bois, of course, was a great historian, and this great book, The Philadelphia Negro, uh, was done right here in the south of Philadelphia. Uh, he lived here for a while. So we are delighted that uh, Dr. Dove will speak about uh, the great honorable uh, Sheikh Ahmed Joe. And then after that, I'm going to try to give a little talk about uh, the dangers of the doctrine of white supremacy and try to relate that to some of the events that are going on today. At this time, none other than the outstanding rapping professor, Dr. Jabali Ahmed. Hey, everybody. Hey. It's always funny they say the rapping professor, and then you say, you guess you got to rap. <laughs> but I used to start like this, I say, I used to pray to speak like this to peeps like this, Coretta and Martin. Queens and kings like this, in the back of a paddy wagon, cuffs was on my wrist, but thinking, man, our ancestors had it worse than this. When our dreams take hold, nightmares are through. It's time to marry our destiny, and I say I do. Far as freedom, you gotta see it with a clear eye view, so the ancestors could bless us like we said I you. But you gotta read, let that breathe, before they come for me, I'm getting deep. I never let no fear get in between intended targets. Literally finish what you started. They love us deaf, dumb, and blind. They hate it when we get smarter. I went and got it regardless. Vision it like an artist. When the struggle gets harder, remember that you the hardest. Be a god or a goddess, put people over your prophets and pay no minds and them cowards. I tell my haters, I got this. See, I know that my mind is power. I'm speaking to take us higher. At the Institute, we bring fire. So I keep it real so the chosen can be inspired. When you got your mind right, then the hate increase. They blame it on sagging pants or copping beats. So I murder beats from the streets to the barbershops. Fans be like, oh, hey, your bars are hot. You gotta pop if you ain't talking about uplifting. What we talking about? Yeah. Real cases move in silence. You see, some talk a lot. I'ma use my words, and I'ma use the word on my grind until we get what we deserve. Now get up, hold up, wait a minute. They thought we was finished. They took away the money for our schools to build the prisons. Flexing on my haters just like Popeye with his finish. Double linear, I'm a G, I make a movement, making millions. Type the time with them 
Garvey and them Dr. Santi quotes. Melissa Harris Perry, some ta quotes. Some Mark Lamar Hill for their young minds to glow. And some names y'all ain't recognize when they Google that when you go. Cause this more than about bill money or just keeping it real. Those who want this truth before us been killed. They caught around that put them down. They in the ground, no joke. I come and make this clear for y'all. No mirrors and no smoke. Yo, all I know is learning. When it comes to me, I got books on Afrocentrics. I got books on Dr. King. Got my BA3 MA and how to get two PhDs. And every time I give a lecture, I be turning up the heat. <laughs> when they say you bring the energy, you have to bring the energy. So just, just briefly, I'm not going to take my whole 20. I'm just happy to be in, in the company of those who have dedicated their lives, you know, to uplifting our people to such an extent. And I remember with Brother Malcolm, uh, they'd ask about the introduction. And he would say, make it plain. And make it plain means don't take too long. So I plan to make it plain <laughs> and, 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 and do what I, that I need to do and then go ahead and take my seat and, and be a student, you know, because in order to be a leader eventually, you have to understand how important it is to have the humility and the deference to be a follower and a student. So I'm thankful that Dr. Santi asked me one day if I ever considered the PhD in African American Studies. And I was like, what? Didn't even know they had those. No. But no, I, I knew, I knew, I knew. But I didn't know it was for me. So sometimes That's people can right. see something That's in right. you That's before right. you see it in yourself. That's right. And when I read documents from the counterintelligence program, That's right. and they were discussing who would be, you know, an adequate leader to lead a Mau Mau style rebellion, and who could be a potential Black Messiah. And they said the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had such capabilities, but they said he was too old. And they said that Dr. King if he had abandoned his his adherence to the establishment, the passive nonviolent strategy. He had the potential, but they said Stokely Carmichael. They said, oh, that one right there. So, so um, good that he took that trip, right? So, so it, it, I, I realized that your enemy might see something in you That's before right. you recognize That's it's right. there or before it manifests itself for the benefit of your people. That's right. Somebody say deep bell. So, so I looked around and I said, there must be a reason for people to distract people with, with, with potential, right. right? So it's important for us, I always say, we have to be more sophisticated than our enemy to expect liberation. So the same way that they realize and recognize, like a King Herod style, like to cut it off before it actually blooms and blossoms and benefits us, we have to be an uh, understanding of our potential, you know, with our words. That's right. I heard a sister say online that she had uh, bought some candy for some young people, and um, they were asking where your parents were. And the young people said, uh, we're fine, you know, we're my, we're my cousins. And the sister started to tear up on the video. And she said, the, the young person said to her, Thank you for being so nice to me, ma'am. Nobody's ever nice to me. And she just started to cry, and that was this child's reality. And I say to myself all the time, this is replicated millions of times throughout the United States every day in young black America. People say, well, why did they do it? How did they get this way? You know, I say, this is a long road and an ethnographic study that's required, right? That's okay. If you go through days and months and, and years of, of nobody being nice to you, like, I think like, we need to, to really digest this as, as, as elders and adults. We, we love talk, talking about what the young people aren't doing and what they aren't learning and that they don't show up to events like this, right? But on our way here, did we smile at them or did we That's look right. at them like we feared them? Do, do we step over them? Or, you know, when, when they're trying to pump our gas and they're trying to, 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 to walk our groceries to the car. Like, there's so That's many right. times that people try so many ways just to be seen, just to be heard, just to show themselves of some value, right? And they're dismissed. You don't have a job, you don't have a degree, you don't, you're not old enough, you're not, where are your parents, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes if you see somebody without something, you fill in and you step in the gap. That's right. But when it comes to the young people, you hear things like, where's your parents? Mm -hmm. Well, nobody's going to put a sign on their neck saying my parents abuse me, parents don't love me, I never met my dad. Mm -hmm. It's not going to look like that. It might look like a curse word on a bus filled with elders. Mm -hmm. It might look like a, a, a person not wearing a belt even though they own three, right? They're going to find ways to let you know that dad is not home. But you have to understand how to speak the language of neglect, the language of abuse, the language of a generation abandoned in order to reach a level where you can find in them that potential seed, you know, so we can, you know, germinate in such a way that we can speak life into their lives. Cause the t entire trajectory of my life was transformed by a statement that might have took four seconds to make. He just asked me a question that caused me to ask myself a question that caused me to consider myself in a different light than I did previously. And when I realized that I can potentially one day have that same power over people, 
every time somebody walks into my office, I'm like, whoa, this could be it. I'm going to really be careful about what I say. And I'm going to be really careful about my countenance and my energy and what kind of spirit is in this space. Because this might be the only time this today, this week, or this month that this person was even considered right. as something beyond their circumstance. Right. I'm going to see you in 10, 20 years when you can't even see yourself past today. You might stumble into the office crying, ready to give it all up, and i got to put you back together like a star in a set, Humpty Dumpty style, and send you out there thinking you can be the next great leader of the black world. So I thank you. So thank you. The one thing I want to leave them with, I want us to start to present history. When I say present history, it's a play on words, like in the present moment, using historical context to transform the contemporary environment, right? Because we do a lot in terms of research right. and understanding the past. But what I appreciate about the Institute is that you get to witness in real time the practical application and fruits and benefits of study. That's right. It's not somebody talking, but you don't know they got a wife or they don't they got kids like your favorite YouTube stars. That's right. It's not somebody who's talking about the pyramids and all this Mansa Musa, but they didn't pay their phone bill and That's they don't right. file their taxes, right? <laughs> right. I'm talking yeah, about practical vote. Yeah, don't vote. It's practical <laughs> application. Because all these conversations That's that I used right. to have always ended up with somebody saying, we need our own. That's no right. matter what it was, I don't care if it was a spiritual debate, That's religious debate, right. somebody right. would say, we need our own schools. We need our own institutions. We have one. Right? And oftentimes, you got to be careful what you ask for. Because sometimes, if you ever, you know, went against your parents and you got your chance, right? You say we need it, and now we have it, and now the onus of responsibility is not on the leadership anymore. So we can't say, well, I don't like this leader because of this. I don't like this leader because of that. Now, it's not about the leadership. Now it's about your turn to contribute to the legacy that's been established for the benefit of the people in the community. That's right. This isn't a gated community. That's right. This thing could have been built a lot of places. That's right. And it didn't have to be built. That's right. There was nobody that mandated Dr. Asante take his own money and, and build this. That's right. So here we have an example of leadership that is what we always wanted. We always wanted the sovereignty and the independence, economically, institutionally, and otherwise, to not be beholden to the government, say what we want, and be who we are. That's right. So with that being said, I urge you to support the Institute at every available opportunity before you need it. Don't do like the Superdome. Don't do like Joe Osteen chirping closed the doors after that after the disaster. Don't, don't, come, don't have it get crazy. Y'all come run to the Institute, and the whole time we've been saying, support the Institute. You know? And then they get mad that we closed it. Then. You keep us open every day. Make sure you give it support. Shout out to Dr. Santi and the Institute. Uh, salute to Dr. Dove and all the speakers on the agenda. And shout out to you for continuing to support. Much love. Hotel. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I told you that brother brings the energy all the time. Yeah, he, he knows how to, how to do it. So we're really, really happy, really proud. And thank you so much, Dr. Ade. So uh, we also, you know, um, we want to just say hello to Belinda Wilson. She's one of our members. She's really, she's really one of the great ones. And we're really delighted that she's here as well. So, okay, now Dr. Nam Dung. Uh, coming uh, to talk to us a little bit about uh, Sheikh Hunter Joe. Uh, and uh, this is stuff that we are also putting into practice, mm -hmm. actually. Thank you very much.
um, retrieval of the story of Africa and what happened on our complicated journey as humans to arrive at this point in time. So it's just such a valuable site for this work to go on. Um, we have come to understand through important works of those who try to go beyond the accepted imposition and inculcation of falsehood in our minds. A trial we face every day as the lovers of war and pestilence impose challenges to the lovers of truth, justice, reciprocity, democracy and harmony. Those of us who gather here today are the truth seekers who challenge chaos and injustice in all its forms who refuse to accept the fractured bits of information that have no dates of origin, that we are forced through schooling and rhetoric and media to accept as true. Even the idea of prehistory is a way to erase all that came before. A particular time that has been determined by the conquerors as more relevant. Dr. Santi has developed the discipline of apocology as an authentic school of thought and methodology that is grounded in the experiences of knowledge transferred culturally over thousands of years by those ancestors who left their legacy so that we may continue um, to hand on. Um, from the days of black studies, Dr. Asante recognized his ancestral and cultural heritage and has fought against all odds to build the discipline and thereby embrace and recognize the struggles and experiences that brought us here, never denying the lives of those who came before who were all part of this work that has culminated in an, uh, in an academic discipline that, unlike any others that came from a theory grounded in the love of black humanity that has been demonized and delegated, Africology challenges the elaborate story contrived to justify the murders of hundreds of millions of Africans, <coughs> the Ma'atha, that denies the glory of Africa and the black people in its world. Um, Dr. Sheikh and to Jill, born in Senegal in 1923, is recognized by Africology as a multi-genius in that he was politically oriented, studied several disciplines, language, anthropology, psychology, African history and physics, among many. He's recognized for his works within the discipline of anthropology. Um, the significance, um, his work has really been to understand the significance of culture as a tool of analysis and to understand differences in values and beliefs and thoughts and behaviours among humanity. Um, unlike the current understanding of culture, which is superficial and simplistic based on anthropological ideas, prejudiced in the main to hierarchize the notion of culture in relation to race. Um, he has come to really help us um, to understand that differences in humanity are really grounded in culture and not race. Um, race is a, is a cultural construct that has been used to justify uh, the treatment of African people, which you so eloquently pointed out. Um, and to uh, not only to treat African people in an abominable way, but to take everything from African people, from the lands, to the knowledge, to the spirituality, and to close off ways that African people can begin to uh, reclaim and see self uh, beyond the story that's been constructed. His work is so valuable because we understand that humanity came out of Africa, that we are all one people, literally 99 points percent the same um, in terms of genetics, but genetics has been used to see 
uh, feel at times as races of people, different or disconnected, coming from different points of the globe. Whereas in fact, in scientific reality, people travelled out of Africa after, after at least 250,000 years of being there to populate the rest of the world. So uh, we changed according to environmental uh, experiences. And we've come How to amazing our eyes are. All you have to do is staring at the white circle. Don't blink. Now I'm going to show you. So anyway, we've come to be known as races because it, what it does is to separate us all and keep us all on different paths uh, in, a, in notions of a hierarchy with the whitest person at the top and the whitest person at the bottom, the most superior at the top and the most superior at the bottom. And this is a, an elaborate story that we are taught every day. But through Africology, we're able to go back to uh, a cultural history that existed thousands of years before the conquest of Africa and before the construct, the cultural construct of race as a way to justify um, the demonization of Africa. And um, in, in creating this um, method of control, um, it, it has been, I mean, we're all part, maybe not all of us, part of religious groups, um, modern religious groups that exist all over the planet. And these religious groups have held on to, have created they're um, beginning with uh, the debasement of the African mother. They've created a hierarchy and a belief that is not true um, about the African mother as the mother of humanity, um, who has been seen to be uh, immoral, um, or, or, or there is a question of her morality makes the woman, the African woman, um, inferior because of, uh, um, because of her immorality, supposed immorality, and, and at the same time that the African woman has been debased. The African man has also been debased, the father of humanity, so when you look at these religions like Islam, Christianity, um, Hebraic studies um, and um, Brahmanism, Hinduism, you can see in there how the woman, the African mother, has been debased. And um, from this debasement has arisen, really has concretized the notion of race. Um, they, so in demonizing and debasing the beginning of humanity, one is creating a notion that black women and men are inferior, beginning with immorality, and then later on, as we all know, uh, Europeans created the idea of a science that could say that genetically, based on the melanin content of the skin, that those with the least amount of melanin in the skin would be the most superior and the most would be, and those with the most melanin would be viewed as inferior. And um, this has been uh, taught us every day through school and throughout our lives. And this is the struggle that we are trying to challenge, that Africology is trying to challenge. And this is what DL is able to give us, um, the understanding that through culture, uh, that cultural differences were the things, what is, is how we are so different in our thoughts and behaviors. And he saw culture as being so in effective that it could influence how we think 
and how we see the world. So, um, you know, this, this is such a serious situation that we actually have um, inculcated <coughs> values of, of the enemies of the people who see us as inferior and we are looking through their lens to make judgments about each other consequently. Um, we can sometimes be the worst judges of who we are and hate ourselves, mm -hmm. kill ourselves mm -hmm. before anybody mm -hmm. else. But in doing this, we're really carrying on the work of the conquerors. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know because Every day we're having information that is telling us a story that is not true. So um, Africology enables uh, us to look at classical Africa before African conquests by enslavers and colonists and to really uh, have a window or a view to who the African person really is and much of this history has been contrived to uh, prevent this from happening. So, you know, in studying Africology, it gives us a place to be able to do the research, to challenge these ideas, to look at the ancient principles um, whose standards are so powerful and so good, uh, we don't even understand them. And, and how to use them today because we're often looking at Africa as evolving and progressing into who we are today. So we may say, oh, because we've got computers and things, we're really advanced. But, you know, if in the world um, there are so many people who have nothing, who are being murdered and uh, genocide is being committed against them, then how can we see this as progress when in the past we have been able to feed ourselves and think on higher levels mm -hmm. and part of the problem with the, with the clash of cultures is that African people thought on higher levels and the, uh, those who are descended, we're all descended from African people whatever colour we are, however we look, we are all the same mother and father. Those who have created these ideas um, have been able to um, fill our minds with their thoughts. Um, I'll really end up with that because I just say that I just stand <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, Dr. Dove is a serious scholar, mm -hmm. and uh, a serious scholar gives you a lot to think about. And, and I was sitting there thinking about so many of the things that uh, we can uh, discuss. But uh, I'm very, very happy, very pleased uh, to see that uh, our audience has picked up uh, as it will, uh, and uh, I'm just so delighted because uh, this is a place where we have been teaching uh, for, for many, many years, and we're very happy to be here again. Okay, I want to talk about 20 minutes myself. And I see Steve Sattel here. How are you doing, Steve? Steve is one of the, the guys who gave me an award earlier this year, so I appreciate that for Philadelphia, the award from Philadelphia. Uh, the uh, dangers of the doctrine of white supremacy. I'm not going to call it the dangers of white supremacy, because there is no white supremacy. There, there are the dangers of the doctrine of white supremacy. Uh, a few, few months ago, I came from South Africa. I went to South Africa to visit and came from South Africa. And in South Africa, they have a situation where now there are a growing number of white people on the streets of South Africa who are homeless and who are begging. 
And they interviewed some of them and said, well, how, how did this happen? One time, uh, you were dominating the society. Uh, you were a minority of people, population, of four or five million, and you were dominating a country of 40 million people. And you were basically in charge of everything. And now you have a growing homeless population. And they, they said, at that time, we had privilege because we were white. And we didn't know what our uh, fathers and mothers were doing to black people. We just lived our lives. We had black servants, black people working for us. We uh, treated them uh, like dirt because we could do it. That was our privilege. And when the government became a democratic government and the whites were voted out of power and the blacks were voted into power, then the black people said, everything is based on merit. So when you base things on merit and you get jobs not because of your color, but you get jobs because of your merit, then what you discover is that white people are no superiors to anybody, that everybody's the same. No, all people have the same problems. And if white people did not go to school as they didn't because they didn't have to go to school to get a job, you didn't have to go to school to be a bank manager. You didn't have to go to school to lead a corporation or to be put in charge of black people before apartheid ended. But when apartheid ended, you got to have education. And the black people had education. So many of them now suffer from that. And I, that was a very strong message to me because uh, I grew up in Georgia, in the United States. I've never seen white people begging on the streets until I went to South Africa like that. Of course, now I see them in Philadelphia, but I hadn't seen that before. But it was because privilege protected them from the same obstacles and the same situations that confronted black people every day. And so that's why I say there is no white supremacy. Uh, there is a doctrine of white supremacy, and that doctrine of white supremacy uh, has, has a hold on the population, a certain population, not all white people in America, but a certain population in America. And let me say this, the doctrine of white supremacy also has a hold on some black people. So it's not, just, it's not just a black and white thing, there are some black people who believe in the doctrine of white supremacy. So how is it maintained? It's maintained by church, it's maintained by schools, by colleges, it's maintained by the economic sectors, uh, by banks, uh, how banks uh, give loans to people for houses and so on. It, it's maintained by corporations, what they teach and what they demonstrate. It's maintained by unions, it main, main, it's maintained by police, and, and it's maintained, we know now, by the Supreme Court. Uh, and. It's it, uh, it maintained by unequal interpretations of the law, especially in terms in, uh, of prison term, time that's given to black people, black people who commit crimes. So this is a big problem, this doctrine of white supremacy. This doctrine is not taught uh, in a classroom necessarily unless you're in some far right wing uh, organization, but it is taught in experience. It is taught in life, you know, what people do and how they treat people. I just want to read you quickly sections from the 14th Amendment because I think sometimes people talk about Constitution and people don't know what the Constitution is saying. I mean, we, we have one great scholar, one of the greatest scholars in the world was Dr. Yosef Ben Yakana. And he, he wrote a, a major book called Black Man of the Nile and His Family. And sometimes I would run into brothers and sisters and I would say to them, uh, have you read Dr. Ben? And they would say yes. And I knew they would be lying because anyone who's read that seven or 800 page book, you know, I mean, in the way it was written, it was very difficult. Very few people read, but we read parts of it, you know what I'm saying? So people have read parts of the Constitution, they know some things about the Constitution. 14th Amendment says all persons born 
are naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within the jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. This was done, actually, uh, uh, in order to protect African uh, people after the enslavement. Because otherwise, the whites who believed the white supremacy, they, they didn't care anything about the rights, I mean, about the fact that they had lost the war. They were still going to treat black people any way they wanted to treat them. But at any rate, the, 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 uh, the 14th Amendment continues. Representatives shall be apportioned. That is how you, how you um, remember how you uh, choose people to represent you in government. Uh, before this, the Constitution had itself and its articles said something about people, uh, about counting people based on uh, the fact that there were many people who were enslaved, you know. Uh, at the time that uh, slavery was ended in this country, we were about four million. And um, in the states where there were many enslaved African people, uh, the states that did not have enslaved African people felt like if all the enslaved Africans were counted, uh, then the representative representatives in the southern states where there were enslaved people would be more than in the states where there were mostly white people. So they made a, a rule that each African person who was enslaved would only be counted as three-fourths of a human being. So that, that was the, uh, a, a compromise that uh, the South said that they would give to the North. Say, okay, so you mad that we have so many black people, but uh, these black people that are enslaved, uh, they're not necessarily contributing so much, so let's just give, let's just, we'll say three-fourths and so on. But now that black people are free, the 14th Amendment had to change that. So it said, representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons. Everybody, now not three, three, four, but in the whole number of persons, and each state excluded Indians. They, they, didn't, they didn't count Indians in this because they said Indians were not taxed but when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for president and vice president of the United States, representatives in Congress, the executive and judicial officers of the state, or the members of the legislation thereof is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such states. See, these were males. The male inhabitants of such states, being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States, in any way of bridge except for partition. For, you, you can't bridge the rights of any male who's over 21 years of age except for his participation in rebellion or other crime. The basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens 21 years of age in such a state. And then they, they ended it something, well, then they wrote this. And we'll go back to that in a minute. No person shall be a senator or a representative in Congress or elected a president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same. Or give an aid of comfort to the enemies thereof. The Congress may, by a vote of two thirds of each house, remove such disability. The validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law 
including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services, and suppressing insurrection or rebellion shall not be questioned. But neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States, or any claim for the loss of emancipation of any slave, but all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. The Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. That's the 14th Amendment. Now that's very important today. It's been important. It's been important for the first time. I mean, in fact, it is probably one of the reasons that they even created the Department of Justice. This is, this is because it was necessary. So how are you going to enforce, you got four million people who were enslaved and they, they and their ancestors have been enslaved for 200 and almost 250 years. And now they're free. What, what are you, you going to do? How are you going to protect this population? But remember this. This was only males. Women were not protected. Black women were, as Dr. Dunham said, were the least protected. And, the, and, and, and this, this is, this is, this is it's insane. But this, this, this was supposed to be an improvement. You see what I mean? 14th Amendment was an improvement. Because it, it said a, a male, 21 and above, should not have any abridgment of privilege. You see. But, but it had, had to be a male. And this starts off because it had to be a white male originally. You see. Because the whole thing was based, the whole constitution was based on white male privilege. That's what it was. It was that was the doctrine. That's why you had the genocide of the native peoples. You know, you know here's a society that was created by killing as many natives as you could. Let's kill the Native Americans. Go ride, ride around on Sunday on your horse and shoot people down, kill them. And that's, that was a culture. And, you, and we forget that. We don't understand how this could be, but the genocide of the Native people and the enslavement of the African people, these come <coughs> out the two pillars, the great pillar of the American uh, society. And this also, there's another part to that, and that is the patriarchy, where you have the domination of women. We always talk about Islam dominating women, the domination of women by Islam. But so was it true here, and so is it true here now. I mean, women are the only people who can't control their body. Whatever, I mean, men control their body. That's what the, that's what the Supreme Court just said. Your, your body is not yours. You're not autonomous. A man and groups of men can decide what a woman can do with her body. That, that's, 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 the, that's the heart of the patriarchy, which is the center of the idea of the doctrine of white male domination. That's that. No, there, there, if you get rid of that, you can understand everything. Everything becomes simpler. But if you don't understand white male patriarchy and domination, you will not understand America. There's no way you can make any sense out of anything. You can't make sense out of laws. You can't make it sense out of education. You can't make sense out of the corporate world. How some people are rich and others are poor. You can't make no, you you have no understanding. Because it's the doctrine, you see, of white male domination that makes this and, and causes this, you see. And and they did everything. And, uh, they, they also, as I said, withheld the vote from uh, women as well, the right to vote. And, uh, and I think that a fierce win of white male patriarchy has swept over certain areas of this country. And, and when I think back to uh, uh, my uh, years of growing up, uh, the, the big threat uh, when I was a child, and it actually started about the time I was born, uh, was the, um, the Nazi regime. Right, the, the Nazis in, in Germany. Because one of the things that the Nazis did 
was to create a whole theory that somehow white people were superior to other people. I said they created it, but they didn't create it. Dr. Dell pointed it out. It existed in, uh, in many texts. It, it, it actually, it, it, interestingly, existed in the Hebrew text with uh, the children of, of Noah and th that whole story. The ones who should be servants of others and all that. But even before the Hebrews, it existed with the, uh, the Hindu. That whole uh, caste system where the darker people were the ones who were at the bottom, th that, they created that. That, was, that, that. that wasn't natural. Nobody created you know, you, you, people sat down and created and said, okay, well, who are these people? Well, the people who were conquerors who came in from Europe into India, the Indo-Europeans, what they did when they found the majority of the people were black people, they said, how are we going to control these people? And the way they control them by religion. They said, well, our religion says if you are black, then you're at the bottom. You're going to be a sutra or you're going to be a Dalit. You, you're not going to be a Brahmin. You, you're not going to be at the top. Only the lighter people at the top, you see? And the darker people at the bottom. That's in the Hindu religion. And it's also true with the Islamic religion. It's the same. That this whole notion of who was closest to the, the prophet, Muhammad. If you're black, you're farther away from him. You see? Everybody wants to be close to the prophet because, you know, it, it, it get you, you know, and then they, they honor and they revere Bilal. But Bilal is not a prophet. So this is a whole thing working on the mind. And then what do you have? We have black people who take it on and say, yeah, it's black. Yeah. We at the bottom. <laughs> you know what I mean? They at the top. And this is the law of nature. This is supposed to be like that. No, it's not. <laughs> and you know it's not supposed to be like that. You know racism is not supposed to uh, be like that. Race, race itself was a created notion. People create these races. They put, they say, okay, if you're European, this is where you belong. If you are Medi uh, if you are Asian, this is where you belong. If you're Native American, this is where you belong. If you're black, this is where you belong. Black people didn't create that. We never had any interest in creating this foolishness like that. But because we knew it was not right, it's not right. It's not humanity. It's not human. It's not correct. It is wrong. All forms of oppression, all forms of them, must be seen as anti-African because they are anti-human, and the Africans are the first humans. Homo sapiens rise first on the continent of Africa. There are no human beings before the Africans. Nowhere does not exist anywhere else. To, as, he, as Dr. Dove said 250,000 years ago, all people in the world were black. And all people in the world lived in Africa 250,000 years ago. They lived nowhere, nowhere else. <coughs> Think about that. We didn't migrate, human beings did not migrate out of Africa until 70,000 years ago. 70,000 years ago, human beings started migrating out of Africa. But before that, everybody was all black. All there's a whole black world in, in Africa, you see. Our, our declaration today, my declaration today, is that African culture, African culture, is stands as a model of the best of human culture. That's the best. We go the further back we go, then what we have to see is that culture is the is the thing. That's what Africans develop. Notions of ma'at, ideas of character, iwa pele, as the Yoruba say. You, you don't have to be black in color to express African culture. Let me read that again for y'all. This is just a note I took today. You don't have to be black to express African culture. Because if, if you had to be black to express it, we could explain a lot of things. Don't go to sleep on me. <laughs> we, can't have, we can't explain Clarence. <laughs> the Clarenceization of the black population happens every day. Clarence Thomas's. You can't explain. There's no explanation. You, you, you have to abandon the idea that color 
is that color is at the basis of culture. And that color is above culture. Color is not above culture. I can't explain her show walk. Or your favorite Ben Carson. <laughs> they're black. Just, just because somebody says they're black or look black, you, you can't think that they believe in my art or have good character or good, mor or good morals or good values. You can't believe that. You don't, you, we don't know that. So that's why it's a danger. Race and racism, these are dangerous ideas. And white the doctrine of white racial supremacy is to me one of the worst because it accepts this notion of white racial domination, the subjugation of black people and brown people and the elevation of Europeans and European culture as if it's the only one. My stand is a rejection of this ideology. We must see ourselves in constant struggle against it. Our Afrocentric aim is nothing more than human liberation, not just for blacks, but for all oppressed people with no regard to gender, color, or origin. Let me say that again. Some of y'all go, I didn't get the wrong. All oppressed people are the people that must be targeted for human liberation, all oppression. And with no regard to gender, color, or origin, it should be clear that all true revolutionaries oppose racial thinking. I don't know one that doesn't. And I start with the greatest. And Julius Nyeri in 1976 gave a talk at the Six Pan African Congress and one of the most powerful lines he said to all these black people coming from all over the world, he says, we must oppose racial thinking. And I didn't, we didn't understand him at the time because we were all in the race. You know, wait a minute, man. We black people. How are we gonna be opposed? How are we gonna be opposed to racial thinking? He said, you gotta oppose racial thinking because racial thinking turns you into your enemy. And, and, and that's not, but what doesn't turn you into it, your enemy is to say, okay, we believe in African culture. African, this, this is, a, a part of the problem with us as African people in the past, with, with Europeans, for example, has been, we said we greet you with open arms. We bear no weapons. Come and eat with us. And they didn't understand that culture. They said, oh, they're like children. They just let us come on in here and, you know, eat with them and take over everything. Oh, wow. What a, or, as they said to the uh, indigenous people in Hawaii, when they came with the ships to Hawaii, the Hawaiians came out with lays of, with flowers and their canoes and brought them fruit to the ships of the Europeans. And the Europeans wrote in their diaries, these people think that we are lost gods coming back to them. The way they treat us with such generosity. That's a mis misunderstanding of hospitality. Mm -hmm. Misunderstanding of generosity, you see? So our struggle is to fight oppression. And we have to, uh, to, to know that as long as African people are attacked because of color, we will have to stand <coughs> together to fight that kind of oppression as well. That's why we stand. When we start talking about Pan-Africanism, we are fighting because of the, the, the historical, con historical condition <coughs> and the social and political circumstances that have brought about uh, uh, this black oppression. Our struggle is for culture, a culture of my art, grounded in character, and, and that's what uh, Sheikh Hunter joked. Believe, and that's what he wanted. A culture mob grounded in character, good character, Iwa Pele. It is not domination we seek, but humanity, collective, strong, determined, 
and base vigorously on moral justice. We condemn today. I stand here today and I condemn uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But, but I also condemn Saudi Arabia's invasion of Yemen. I, 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 con I condemn Israel's occupation of the Palis Palestine, of the Palestinian people. I, I, I condemn that. I condemn the United States' invasion and occupation in Syria. I, I condemn the Libyans' uh, destruction of the Tubu people in, in Libya. I condemn and have to condemn France in Mali, the assault on the Malian people by the French. I, I condemn the Turkish assault on the Kurds. I have to condemn that. These intrusions and others against other people cannot succeed ultimately. Hatred is the enemy of unity. Betrayal, the source of all conflict. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we have time to uh, for questions. You want to take questions? Okay. Hello, hello. All right, Toyo Abrid. Yeah. Yes. Toyosi. Thank you all so much for coming. We don't have any questions from the chat on YouTube, but they thank you all for your lectures. Oh, thank you. So we'll take some questions here. Dr. Anderson, I saw your hand. Uh, I just moved here last year, but isn't there a person running for office in Pennsylvania now that supposedly financed trips to the insurrection last year? January 6th, I think. Uh, yeah, Mastriani. Mastriani. He's the guy running for governor. Yeah. Okay. So basically, he violated the 14th Amendment, didn't he? If he, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he tried to overthrow the government. That's one of the real, thank you very much, uh, Doctor. That's one of the real reasons that this 14th Amendment has come up in discussions lately on the news is because uh, what the uh, insurrectionists uh, of January the 6th are trying to do is to uh, quiet this fire that now uh, people are, have, have seen growing uh, around the 14th Amendment. Because it, the 14th Amendment, of course, was also written uh, to ensure that the people who had fought in the Civil War on the side of the Confederates, on the side of the South, mm -hmm. that those people would not be in, in public office, you see. So, 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 so what has happened now is that this term insurrection and rebellion against the government is now being applied to those people of January the 6th who took over the Capitol. And, and it's correct. They, they shouldn't be allowed to run for any office. Okay. If you violate the Constitution, mm -hmm. you're going against the laws of the land yourself, mm -hmm. and now and you, you want to overthrow the government, no, you shouldn't be allowed to run for office. They, they shouldn't, in fact, they probably should have prison term time, mm -hmm. you see. But this is, but that, you're perfectly right. And we have a guy running for governor in the state of Pennsylvania, Mastriani, who uh, was in support of that. In fact, was there himself. This is, how can this be? If this is a country of laws, and if they put my brother and my sister in prison for, uh, you know, so, some small thing, why shouldn't these people? Uh, not serve to, uh, time for what they have done against the United States government. That's the way it looks to me. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Yes, I see a question. And please let us know which lecture you're going to ask a question to. Uh, this is Dr. Osaki. Okay. Um, we hear you talking about the condemnation of the, the people against other people. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the Great Reset or not, or the New World Order. Um, the Great Reset is a upbringing, or is a, uh, I guess, an upgrade of the New World Order. Mm. The Great Reset is basically run by technocrats, the, mm. the Gates, the, the Bezos, the Teslas, and all that sort of thing, right? Mm. What they're saying is that there's too many people in the world. Mm. And you don't need 7 billion people to run the world. Mm. All you need is 500 million. Mm. So this COVID thing, this AIDS thing, this Ebola thing, mm -hmm. 
is all about reducing the population, first of all, of Africa, mm -hmm. but, but, but the rest of the world as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have a very, very, very big problem because a lot of countries and politicians have signed on to that agreement. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. to dominate, you know, see, so, you know, Genghis Khan tried to mm -hmm. conquer the world. Mm -hmm. Hitler tried to conquer the world. Mm -hmm. You know, not many countries and whatever tried to conquer the world. They were, they were what was the mistake? The mistake was they, you know, they tried to do it by themselves, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And so the rest of the world came in and fought them. Mm -hmm. Now, they have a, a, a corporate agreement mm -hmm. with almost everybody that so called so, so in the world to basically take over the world. Mm -hmm. um, after a while, you will need uh, you know, to put a biochip in your hand so you, you can get groceries. You, know? mm -hmm. you heard of virtual wallet, mm -hmm. you heard of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. yeah, cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. on and on and on. Yeah, so it's going to be, it's, it's even deeper than that. I'm, I'm, you know, we're going to have to have you come and get <laughs> <laughs> You know, he's one of our, one of our uh, I mean, famous lecturers and one of the great leaders of African American psychology. And he's been lecturing here for years. And uh, so we're going to have to, we're going to put you on our schedule. Yes, talk for yes. that. In the meantime, Dr. Anderson, you want to talk about the reset, um, the great reset? Uh, one of the things that we're researching now, okay. just to simplify it. Can everyone hear him clearly? This should probably come on a mic for you too. Okay. Um, I can turn it like this. To simplify what you said, what's happening, uh, if you read the work of Nomi Prenz, mm -hmm. she has a book out, which they're basically, the reset is saying that between the speculative economy and the real economy, there's a $150 trillion uh, gap. And so they're saying there's too much debt in the world to ever pay off. So they're using terms like, uh, even referring back to Abrahamic scriptures, talking about they're going to probably have to do something like declare a jubilee, which I believe in the Bible says all debts are forgiven. And that's what they're talking about, resetting the world economy like that and justifying because they're saying they already know there's more debt in the world than anyone can ever pay off. And so, as Nomi Prenz's book that's come out recently that talks about how these bankers have uh, set up and structured the world the last generation, and that's what's leading to what they talked about coming out of Davos, Switzerland, the idea of the Great Reset, because they knew that uh, the way the world economy is structured right now is not sustainable. And so that's really kind of what the elites are fighting over. And that's why both of them are, if you pay attention to the media, because right now it shifts every 90 days, but both people on the left and right are saying, we got to get rid of Biden and we can't take Trump back. Because neither one of those people are capable of dealing with the, what the world's going to transition to over the next decade. And so that's why the elites are saying, we need a great reset in order to maintain what they were calling what they call world order. So it does not devolve into total anarchy. And so now the struggle will be retired to what does, following the reset, where is your status in that after that reset going to look like? And so you got the reactionary people that believe in the doctrine of white supremacy, they are trying to make sure their privilege is protected after the reset, which is why they want a bunch of laws passed that take a whole lifetime to change, so it slows down them having to adjust to the reset. And after the reset, they want to make sure that the status of black, brown, and yellow people is unchanged. <coughs> but, but on the other side, from uh, they're saying to that reset, they realize there are too many black, brown, Asian people in the world for the status quo to stay remain the same. So that's why they're saying we're going to have to elevate a few of those people that are not white to make the rest of the black and brown and yellow masses accept the reset. So that is why they will throw out symbolic stuff like, oh, let's give them a Juneteenth holiday and watch them dance. Or let's give them more black people doing the news, doing movies, uh, even uh, some elected officials, some generals and all that. So it gives the illusion that, okay, we are advancing as a whole. They just put a black Colombian woman. I, I, until recently, I didn't know how many black people there were in Colombia. I said, oh, they had to really put her in because there's so many. They can't ignore the uh, growing consciousness of, of people of African descent around the world 
and 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 or people who are from different backgrounds are no going to no longer accepting the status quo. So they're fighting over what the reset is going to look like, and they're going to use the debt that 150 trillion dollars to determine what that looks like when they reset everything over the next decade. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We always have the smart people in this audience. This is the smartest. This is, this, we used to say this is the smartest group of people in Philadelphia. When I come in, when I leave here, I know something. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, brother's good. Yes, please. Uh, my question is twofold. First is um, in support of the institution, what would you say Yeah, they, 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 that, that's a good question, and since um, uh, the person who deals with uh, the, the bills and all of that kind of stuff is in the front, I'm just going to see whether or not she will come and, and answer that uh, question. But what we are planning to do, and for the YouTube audience who they should know this, we will eventually have on YouTube uh, some place where you can donate, but you can also donate also you can also donate, um, uh, Lisa, you can also donate uh, through the website. Will you come and say a few words about how people can donate to the, to the institute through the website? Or, or, yeah, because the sister just asked a good question. Do we have cash app and all that kind of stuff? And I told them to do the financial question. Okay, that's a great question. <laughs> okay, right now we do not have cash out, but we do have, you can write a check, cash, we do have these envelopes. And we're in the process of changing the um, mailing address. So we're going to update these. But you can also donate online through... Um, the website? Yeah, through the yeah. website. Yeah, directly. And you have a couple of options on there. So... Mm -hmm. Um, that'll go directly to PayPal. And um, yeah, that makes it very simple. But Cash App is a good idea because I think if we do Cash App, we can save some of the fees that we pay through PayPal. Yeah, I know um, Professor James Smalls and mm -hmm. for, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Ray Higgins, yes. they make out very well. I've been following them. Mm -hmm. And that's why I asked. Because I thought that would be something great yeah. for here. No, so there are two a lot of people use that. Yeah, and it's very easy and quick. It really yeah. is. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll look into yeah, it. Thank you very much. Yes, it's clear. Okay. Is that but can you still bring your money here? Oh, absolutely. Or, we won't refuse that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll take cash. Um, when you get checks. your new envelopes. When you when get your new Yes, we're just going to put labels on these because we have quite a number of these. But if you're here, and you want to donate while mm -hmm. you're here, you can put it in the envelope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One more, one, one, more, one more question. My question was to Paul. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, sure. um, the second one was, I guess it's for you as well, Dr. Love. Um, how do we begin to move away from this concept of race Dr. and Dr. moving back? Please. How do we move away from the concept race, of race? Yes, and moving back towards culture. Now, we here at the Institute, we know, believe, understand, because mm -hmm. we're in mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But everyday people, how do we begin to turn that around for, for our people? Good question. I think mm -hmm. that, first of all, we have to understand Education is the key, um, you know, in whatever form it can 
Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Brother Sotel. Yeah. Um, I, my question is for Dr. Dove. Um, but I wanted to give a little context uh, to it first. Um, we just came out of the pandemic, um, so everything was restricted, you know, for two and a half years. And I, I think that one of the things that needs to be noted was that in the entire um, Temple University, probably the only or one of the only uh, departments to grow and actually have tremendous growth was Afrocology. And I think that should be, should be noted. Um, when I saw the picture um, when I came in, what was that young guy up, at, up on the wall there? Uh-huh. <laughs> I think I remember him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it must have been my son. <laughs> <laughs> but at, 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 at that time, um, Afrocentricity was under a lot of attack. Mm -hmm. it, it's subtly not under so much anymore. I mean, the Greeks, right. the mm -hmm. Egyptologists, um, it, suddenly they all changed a lot of their literature. Sure. Yeah. And those attacks is, um, is, are, are not happening so much. When I heard Dr. Dove and read some things, um, it seems to me that you're talking about uh, transformational humanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wonder if you would just take um, a minute or two to talk about um, where you see Af Afro um, centricity going, Afro ecology going, um, within the context of the whole. <laughs> well, well uh, can I just say that there's a book called uh, Being Human. We don't have that book here yet, but when we have the grand opening. We're going to sell uh, that book, Being Human Being. Now, being human being, transforming the race discourse, that's what you're really referring to. Uh, as, uh, yeah, I saw that, but that's actually where the yeah, question that, came that from. that was the idea. <laughs> and you, we are, in a sense, in a, a transformative period. And the whole idea is that uh, it was always there, but it was never understood, sometimes even by the people who say they were Afrocentric, didn't understand. And what we were talking about had a lot to do with humanity. I mean, basically, that uh, the reason we, we, we say Afrocentric had to do with the fact that in a collective sense, as African people, we were oppressed. But ultimately, our aim is for human liberation. That's, that's what it has to be. What else could it be? It's not for us to dominate other people. 
We're mm -hmm. not, I'm not seeking that. I wouldn't fight to give my life to be dominating other people. My, my idea is that all human beings should be liberated. And, and I fight for that liberation. And that's what we have to do. And because we're all humans. When someone walks through this door, I don't know, only thing I see is a human being. I don't know anything about their religion, their gender, nothing. I just know there's a human being walking through the door. So, so why am I to respond and act about human beings? I, I, can't, I, have to, I have to see that the ancient Africans, the ones who made it possible for all seven billion of us to live on this earth, those ancient Africans knew people who were short and tall, dark and light, and yet they did not create caste systems, and they did not create race systems. They did not create hierarchies based on your language or anything like that. They saw other human beings, and they res res referred to them. And these are human beings. You see. They didn't do like the Arabs did when the Arabs went to Sudan and said, the people in Darfur, you in Darfur, but you're not the same as an Arab. You know what I'm saying? They, 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 who makes these distinctions? Why you make them? You make them, I think, out of inferiority, if anything. You're just scared of other people. I don't, I don't, you don't have to do that. You treat humans like humans. That is, that's the only way we can move. Dr. Dove, please. Righteousness, order, balance, mm -hmm. harmony, reciprocity. Mm -hmm. These are the conditions of my life. And we thank you so much, Dr. Dow. All right, we're very happy that you've been here today. Uh, let's give one more round of applause to yourselves. <laughs> and we call upon the name of our ancestors far and near, the mother of our mothers and the father of our fathers, to always render mercy and to bear witness for the liberation and the victory of all oppressed people. Ashe! 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. The next time is the fourth Sunday. The next time is on July 3rd.